The California Residential Purchase Agreement form is the cornerstone of every successful real estate transaction in the state of California. In this training video, we will review how to properly complete and use the RPA form step-by-step -step to better serve and protect yourself and your clients. This training is not intended to be a substitute for the advice of your broker, nor that of your attorney. We will cover paragraphs four, five, six, and seven. Our instructor for this video is Kevin Burke. Let's get started. Again, we're talking about the residential purchase agreement. We've covered paragraph one, two, three, three was all about finance. That was, we didn't have enough time for that, but that was a good, that was a good class. Uh, and now we're going to do four. So sale of the buyer's property. So what do you do when the buyer has to sell to buy? Now you're the buyer's agent. You know, you've got a buyer says, you know, I really want to buy that house. I'm in love with it. I have to have it. I, you know, I want to raise my kids there or whatever. Um, and, and then, Oh, but I have to sell my house in order to do it. So remember that pre-qualification, that pre-approval that we spoke about earlier. When you're talking to your part of you, it's not just the lender that pre-approves the buyer. You've got to pre-approve the buyer. You've got to see if you want to work with the buyer. And I'm going to tell you, surprisingly, a lot of people will come to you and, and it won't be half, but a lot of people come to you and say, I have to sell my house in order to buy this one. That creates an opportunity for you. If it's either you're going to take the listing on that house as well, or you're going to get a referral to the uh, an agent in the area wherever they're coming from, right? They're relocating from Iowa or something, and and uh, you might be able to get a referral out of it. So always be thinking on both sides. Remember, in every transaction that you do, there are actually three deals. Your job is to find them. So every transaction, there's three deals. I had a business partner. We were doing hundreds of transactions a year, uh, and she finally got that part figured out, and she was good at it. She's constantly asking questions, you know, about whether or not, you know, they wanted to buy more than one house. We forget to ask our client those things. So this is going to be something we're going to talk a little bit about as we go through. Again, I'm a practitioner like you, and I like making money, and I think that uh, I'm fairly trustworthy, um, and, and as are you. So sale of the buyer's property, number four. And then, of course, I have lost my pen. Ha. I thought I had lost it. No, I haven't. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. I'm going to try to find my pen so that I can annotate things. Aha, I have my pen. Okay, see that? 12 years of college. All right, okay, so let's pull up my annotate button and because you know that's my favorite part of the day. So let's talk about paragraph number four, okay? So this agreement, a, so I got two choices, A or B. So this agreement and the buyer's ability to obtain financing are not contingent upon the sale of any property owned by the buyer. So the default language, if you don't do anything else in paragraph four says, I don't have to sell to buy. I'm, I'm coming to you without a house to sell. So, you know, that's a pretty good deal, right? Okay, but what happens when the buyer has to sell? So, okay, number B says, this agreement, I got to check the box in order for it to apply. Try not to miss that because a lot of times, you know, when you're talking to the other agent about your offer and you, and you finally realize, oh, wait a minute, something's missing here. And, and the other agent wasn't aware that the buyer had to sell a property in order to buy this one. And that's going to start you all over again. So make sure that if they do have to sell to buy, you do check the box. Okay. This agreement, the buyer's ability to obtain financing are contingent upon the sale of property owned by the buyer as specified in the attached addendum, and that's going to be CAR form, COP, okay? So let's take a look at the COP really fast. Now, now these are forms for another class, but I want to show you what they look like just so that you have an idea, um, and we're going to start off here. So this is the CAR form, COP, contingency for sale of buyer's property and notice to remove contingencies, and I'm not going to go through the whole form. Uh, we'll be here all week. So um, it, it talks about the sale of the buyer's property and then a length of the contingency. The buyer's property is not an escrow. The buyer's property is an escrow. What about cancellation of the buyer's property? What about the seller's right to cancel? What about the buyer's right to cancel? What about time periods, buyer's deposits? What about backup offers and seller's rights to have the buyer remove contingencies or cancel? Uh, and then finally, is it an immediate release or, or a, you know, is it a 72 hour clause, that kind of thing. So the reason I'm showing you this is that it is more complicated than just writing language on the form saying, you know, it, you know, we need to sell our house to buy it. It's a lot more complicated. There are a lot more parts to it. And, and the COP form, 
probably accomplishes that better than most forms. I got a couple little quirky things in it, but those are things that we can, we can fix, okay? But in the meantime, remember that the COP form is there to help you, but I, I frequently see, um, gosh, I hope I pulled that up. Yes, I did, okay. I frequently see, I'm gonna go back now, um, I frequently see agents trying to write language into paragraph number six that we're going to get to in a minute that, that uh, they're, they're trying to write all that legal stuff. And, and when I look at a form that's a page long written by the attorneys, I got to tell you something. I'm not taking that challenge on. I'm going to have to trust that it's a standard form and that I'm going to have some protection for using the standard form even though there's really the, the user protection agreement only works at the appellate level. And that just means they'll send a letter, you know, on your behalf. But, you know, so it's like, for me, it's like, yeah, really? Um, listen, I, but if I use a standard form in real estate, then at least I'm better off than if I try to create my own language. So folks, if your buyer has to sell to buy, you're going to check that box right there and you're going to bring in that COP form. Okay. Everybody good with that? All right. Let's go ahead to paragraph number five. Um, and you're going to have transactions that are going to be that way. You're going to be the seller's agent when transactions are going to come in where they have to sell to buy. And then now you're looking, what are the, what's the reality of the buyer's property? Right? Is it listed to sell? You know, some buyer's properties are not listed to sell and you don't want to tie up your seller with a, with a property that, you, you know, with a transaction that isn't going to close, right? Okay. All right. Doesn't do anybody any good. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at paragraph number five. Okay, and so paragraph number five, we're going to talk about addenda and advisories. Now, we're going to cover each one of these. So this is going to take us a couple of minutes. We're going to start off with first addenda. Okay, and then as you can see, here's advisories over here. So let's talk about my backup offer addendum. My backup offer addendum says that I wrote my offer a little bit too late. The, another offer got there in front of me. Let me uh, pull this up here. Another offer got there in front of me, and and so now what do I do? Well, see, this is this is so frequently done. I'm sorry, wrong. Okay, and so what's the deal? So here's the thing: you write an offer on a property, and the listing agent says, "Ah, now we've already got an offer." So you know, in some economies, that that for that agent, that's a huge mistake. For you to assume that just because your transaction is under contract, that it's an over, it ain't over. I mean, there is so much that goes on in a real estate transaction. Wouldn't you like to have a backup offer, somebody else that's interested in buying the property that, that you know, maybe you can use it as leverage? So here you are, you come along, you missed it by a day, and you write an offer for your buyer, and you say to the other agent, you say, hey, you know what? We, we, we want to buy your property. Um, let's negotiate as if we were the primary offer, but then we all understand we're going to sign the backup offer addendum, which is going to put us in an official position of backup. So in other words, not only an, an official backup offer, but rather what place am I in? So when I'm looking at my little uh, clock here, I'm either in number one or two or three or four, Okay, and now I have, I've saved my place in line. And as opposed to what you normally see, which is where the agent says, uh, don't worry about it. If I have any problems with the offer, I'll give you a call. You know what? That is, that is weak, weak realtoring as far as the listing agent is concerned. You know, the listing agent, their obligation is to present all offers. And that is, and by the way, the deputy commissioner agrees up until it closes. So they have an obligation to do that. Our MLS rules say the same thing. And unless they have something in writing from the side, writing and signed by the seller that says, don't bring me any more offers, okay? Normally that means that the primary offer, the one that's in place is usually their offer. And that's why they don't wanna see another offer. And I'm just telling you from the practical side of things, okay? So bottom line is, you know, that if you're having trouble getting this presented to the uh, listing agent, you have, an, you have a right to present your offer in person um, and then when, and if it, and if there's already an offer in front of it, you have an offer, you have a right to negotiate uh, and, and frankly, get your offer into an official backup position, not I'll give you a call if anything happens. The mistake on the listing agent side by doing that is that, you know, now your buyer is going to be like, well, I'm going to renegotiate the deal. Obviously your deal's no good. Uh, you know, so now I get to start over again with you and I, maybe I'm not going to make such a good offer as I did in the beginning. So this is a good time for the listing agent to negotiate a really good backup offer. Sometimes a little too complicated for them. They don't understand it. They've never done it before. Sometimes you might have to help them through that. 
But at the end of the day, we're all working together. We're trying to help the buyer find a property. We're trying to help the seller sell their property. And not all transactions close, even in this economy, not all transactions close. So that backup offer, I want to encourage you to be the to, to put your place in line and put it officially in line as to whether you're gonna be the primary or a secondary backup offer, okay? All right, I'm gonna go ahead back to our form and we're gonna take a look at the second one, which is my septic well and property monument addendum. Now, uh, whoops, can you see that? Uh, Yes, you can. Okay, so that let's take a look at that addendum. So here, here we have it right here. I put them all in order so we'd be able to get to them really fast. So this is this is akin to the WPA. If you were around five years ago and you remember the wood destroying pest addendum, this form is the same kind of form. I'm going to see this one go away too. Here's what it says. It says somebody you know in a rural community, somebody's going to have to pay for the cost of a septic inspection, sewer versus septic. Remember septic. That's a big mistake to make if you're not aware of which one it is. Septic is a whole nother animal, okay? I've got houses on both, I can tell you, all right? Well inspection, so if it's not on a public utility, a city water, anything like that, there you might have to have that well inspected. Property monuments, you know, where are the boundaries from the property? Don't tell me it's where the fence is, right? We've all covered that before. It's not where the fence is, okay? Uh, and then allocation costs, who's gonna pay for what? And so that's that's where it, it starts to look like that WPA form that we got away from. Um, and, and so it, it bothers me, it worries me that we have somebody committing to pay for something when they don't know how much that's going to be. I, I'm gonna have to assume that the seller knows you know how much it costs to have their their septic pumped and and stuff like that but that's that's what this form is all about okay everybody good with that uh, let me go ahead and bring us on to um, our next form which is my short sale addendum believe it or not there are short sales going on even today we did our in our fast stats this morning we looked at lender mediated properties and they still exist i mean it's a heck of a lot less than it was but they still exist folks so a short sale addendum means the property is being sold for less than the income for less value than the encumbrances against it. So whatever a loan, you know, the loan on it's five hundred thousand. The property is only worth three hundred thousand. So that would be a short sale. Okay. So let's take a look and see what my short sale form is going to look like. And. Here we go, short sale addendum, and this is gonna be a teacher. So you should look over this at some point. They don't have me explain this one to you yet, but um, I've, I've talked to some people who have said, I'll never do a short sale. Oh my God, there's so You know how many short sales I closed last year? <laughs> I'm going to tell you, right? I got a bankruptcy attorney in our office, a broker. He's a broker with us and, and he loves short sales, right? And we just, we close on all these uh, stuff that nobody would ever touch. And so, you know what? There's money there and you get paid. So, and you're pretty much sure, uh, certain uh, to get paid. So anyway, that's how the short sale addendum works. Um, and then uh, let's go back to my screen here. And now we're going to talk about the addendum addendum. That one's not real complicated. This is, uh, this is the form that I talk about that, that is as close to giving legal advice as you're going to get, right? Notice how this is all blank. Whenever it's blank, that means you can wax eloquent. You can use whatever poetry you want. You can excuse me, you can write things and, and just hang yourself all day long. I'd be really careful about writing addendums. I'd be really careful about writing con uh, counter offers. Be really careful that you know what you're doing when you write the language. Check with your broker, check with your attorney. Uh, if you're working with me, because there's a bunch of people on this call that are with me, obviously you just give me a call and I'll tell you how to write it. So that's what my addendum looks like. And again, look at that, lots of blank. Okay, most of the forms that we fill out are gonna have stuff in them, right? So, you know, we're gonna check boxes and do stuff like that. Okay, court confirmation addendum. So a lot of these forms used to be on another form called the PAA, the Purchase Agreement Addendum. But then we, we, we broke them down since we don't really print these much anymore. Now we've broken them down and just put them as their own separate form because it's no longer about paperwork reduction. Now it's about, you know, the fact that everything is on the internet. So here's my court confirmation addendum. And again, this is an addendum to the purchase agreement. Not a lot to do in here, but then, but I am gonna put in the court date, whatever that date's going to be. Just remember that when you're dealing with a court, you're dealing with probate, you're dealing with family law, formally divorce, you know, things like that, where you're dealing with those courts, 
those courts are going to be looking for you to do your job, the, the, the listing agent, to bring in all offers until it's over. And, and if you sit on offers, the court is very unforgiving for that. So do your job, do the right job, and, and, and you as the buyer's agent, you have a right to present your offer and get your offer in front of the court. So um, you, you would, the, it usually gets worked out with the seller, depending. I used to do a lot of high conflict, you know, uh, sales, you know, where, you know, uh, husband and wife trying to kill each other. Um, and so I usually had, I was pretty unilateral. I could do whatever I wanted to do as far as listing price and commissions and things like that. But I, but I had a job to do and I had to do it right. So uh, um, certainly very fun to work with. Uh, what's the difference between addendum and addenda? So an addendum is, is the singular, Maria. Addenda is the plural. Okay, good. Good question. Thanks for asking that. Nobody reads Latin anymore, right? I had three years, three, four years of Latin, you know, when I was younger. Um, you don't need to have Latin to go to law school. So it just, it just, it just is, okay? But uh, some people think you do. Some people think it helps. I don't know. Other. Now, take notes. Other is where we put other addenda or other advisories, okay? So here, what we do in our office, and you do whatever you need to do, we wanna make sure we incorporate the San Diego forms into our contract, okay? So we always include three forms. We always include the APA. Let me take you to that, okay? And we write it right in there. We write, uh, you know, check the box, SDAR forms, APA, let's see what that looks like. There it is, the Addendum to Purchase Agreement. I love this form, because listen, I want the SPQA in this contract, right? I want the Seller Property Questionnaire, because that's by default in the contract, but now I want the Seller Property Questionnaire Addendum, because that is the standard of practice in San Diego County, okay? We wrote it, it's a great form. The SPQ, the Seller Property Questionnaire, is a state form. They copied our form, folks, the one that we were using called the Seller's Additional Disclosures. So they copied it and made it the SPQ. They just, they made it generic for the entire state. And then we said, yeah, but you missed a bunch of stuff that are important to San Diego. So remember, standard of care, standard of practice, SPQ, and in San Diego, also the SPQ. QA. And so you'll see that in paragraph number one right here, the APA calls out the SPQA and the conditions thereby. So the other thing to remember in this form that is missing, there's no other form in, in, in all of the library, you know, I know, there's no other form in all the library that allows the agent to represent whether or not they are uh, a licensee, I'm sorry, whether the buyer or seller is a licensee, or whether the buyer or seller has a familial interest with the agent, okay? So in the first line down here, buyer or seller is a licensed real estate salesperson broker, we don't know, okay? If you yourself are the buyer, then you need to tell them that you, you know, you need to make sure you fill that out. And then the second part, an agent in this transaction is related to or has a relationship with one of the principles as follows, brother, sister, wife, husband, whatever. You know, I had, I was just talking about this case the other day that I had back in 1988 where, um, um, the buyer and the buyer's agent wrote an offer of the property anyway and ended up litigating against the seller. Um, and in the very first deposition, my favorite place to be, right? Depositions, oh my God, they're fun. Okay, in the very first deposition, it came out that the buyer and the buyer's agent were sisters. Nobody had any idea. And, and that is a DRE violation and it is a licensed loser. Remember my LL, that is a licensed loser. And, and the seller was so angry, seller went after that person's license and got it. And it wasn't, didn't take them much to do that. They just never bothered to tell anybody that they were licensee. So that they were related one to the other. And there's no other form out there that I'm aware of that does it. And I teach this in other states, like in Virginia, they have, that's required by law, it's on the contract. You know, the contract just assumes that, you know, one of you has a license or one of you is related to the licensee. So, so just be aware of that. Um, you know, you need to make sure that you make all the proper disclosures. So I did my, uh, I'm sorry, I was going to show you the uh, SPQA. So let's take a look. Uh, we did the, I'm sorry, we did the APA. We need to do the LAD, the local area disclosures. Now this form, I love the LAD. This came out of our committee. Other people would like to have it. It's a monster. Okay, 
This is the form that they use across the country when they give an example of how you should be using local forms in your real estate transactions. And they use the San Diego form and they say, look at the form San Diego has. This is a cool form. We wish we had this. So we have 26 attorneys on the risk management committee. We've got, I don't know how many brokers, you know, we've got big brokers, small brokers. We got all kinds of brokers. Uh, we have the deputy commissioner. Uh, we have the FBI. We have the department. Uh, the uh, district attorney's office, all these people all descend in this room and we all put this stuff together. Not so much law enforcement, this is gonna be our stuff, but law enforcement is there when we're discussing what the language should be saying. So the LAD is a very powerful form, okay? Um, you need to use it in your real estate transaction, all right? So let's take a look at our next form and that's gonna be my SPQA that I already kind of talked about. That is my seller property questionnaire addendum and another brilliant form. So when I'm doing my disclosures class, I always put the TDS on the, on the left, and then next to that, I put the SPQ, and next to that, I put the SPQA, because one document flows to the next. Notice here, this starts on paragraph five, because the first four paragraphs between the TDS and the SPQ, they covered it, right? So we only had to talk about what five says. And this, is, and this is what we do, we break it down. You are just jogging your memory of things that you should know. And that's why that SPQA is very important. So back to my original uh, discussion, right here where it says other, I put in SDAR forms, APA comma, LAD comma, SPQA, okay? By putting those in the contract, I, I reference them and they bring it into the contract between the parties. Now the seller has to provide one, has to sign the AP, APA. They don't have to agree to the terms of it, but they gotta sign it. Same thing holds true for the LAD, same thing holds true for the SPQA. We, we're gonna wanna make sure we, we close that circuit on things, okay? All right, all right. So um, uh, let's take a look at paragraph number B. And in paragraph number B, we're gonna talk first about the, uh, whoops, question, okay, uh, hold on. Thank you, Maria. Um, uh, Deanne, if our broker doesn't require the SPQA, do we need to have it? So uh, as I've said before, please follow the advice of your broker. If your broker is wondering why it's a good idea, then have your broker give me a call. I'm more than happy to talk to your broker about it, okay? And just because somebody doesn't require it doesn't mean that they're, not, that they're, that they're telling you not to use it. Okay, so it is the local standard of practice to use that form. And so listen, I spent a lot of time in court. I'm hoping your broker doesn't, um, you just never know. But I'm more than happy to walk anybody through it if they need to do that. Local area disclosures, uh, SPQA, these are all very important forms, okay? So again, um, your, if your broker's out of uh, San Francisco, they may not understand the need for, well, actually they would, because you know the SPQA for us in San Diego, they have forms in San Francisco that would blow your mind. I mean, they've got all kinds of stuff up there. So they understand addenda and they understand things that are there to protect us all as licensees. But if your broker says you don't have to have it, then I would probably suggest that you, you, that means you can have it, but unless your broker says, you don't, I don't want it, or I, you, you do not use it, I'm, you're forbidden to use it, I would probably, that's just my non-legal advice, I would probably use it, but again, I want you to follow the advice of your broker, okay? All right, uh, so again, James, so it's uh, the SDAR forms, APA, comma, LAD, comma, SPQA. So, addendum to purchase agreement, local area disclosures, seller property questionnaire addendum. So, the SPQ is required in the contract. It's by default language. We had a big argument about that when we did it, created it so it is required. So, now we add it to this paragraph. We add this to paragraph number five, right here where it says other under A. We add it there so that we, so that it's incorporated into the contract. Okay, you're welcome, James. Thank you for asking. Um, Thirty people on this thing had the same question, so thank you for uh, standing up and doing that. So let's take a look at number B, buyer and seller. Now we're into advisory. So addenda. Remember, addendums add to a contract. Advisories are disclosures. So nobody should have any reason not to use that. Okay, so probate advisory, somebody has passed, all right? And so you're writing an offer on a property that is subject to probate. So let's take a look at what that's gonna look like. And so here I've got my uh, probate advisory. 
So when I check that box back on the contract, it'll bring this form automatically into your transaction. Listen, probates are fairly complicated. All right, I can tell you that, you know, I've got a probate attorney as a client and, and uh, it's an interesting uh, decision to be a probate attorney. So, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, we've got to cover, you know, what is covered, what, what laws apply to, the, to that. And listen, you don't know. I mean, it, and so let's let the lawyers write it out for us so that it shows you what the exemptions are. Seller is exempt from providing the buyer with a transfer disclosure statement, you know, things like that. So we need to make sure we use the proper forms so that we are advising our client because we do not give legal advice. Okay. All right. Um, do we have to list those forms? If you don't list them, good question, DM. If you don't list them, then you're going to get pushed back by the other agent when they say, well, you didn't put it in the contract, so we're not going to give it to you. Okay. And then, and then now you're going to end up doing what I have to do. So frequently, like we'll write an offer on a property that's an REO or something. And the listing agent will say something like, well, you know, we're exempt from the TDS. I don't know. That would be legal advice. So I don't know if you're exempt or not. And then, but you as the agent are not exempt from anything. It's a different civil code. It's the agents are covered by civil code 2079. The duty to provide a TDS is civil code 1102.3. So when the agent says to me, we're exempt and it's like, no, you're not, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the and, and I don't even know that the bank is exempt because remember only the foreclosing bank has exemptions. And again, that would be legal advice, but you know, banks sell properties to banks, but only the foreclosing bank has the exemption. So, and they can be doing things that would require, I represented a bank and, and, the, and the bank calls me up one day and he says, I'm over here in Mira Mesa and I, you know, I took a house back and I'm, I'm putting a new roof on it. I said, oh my God, I said, is it a repair? Or is it a, an improvement? And he says, no, I just wanted to put a new roof on it. I get over there to the house and this thing is gutted, right? And this, I told him, I said, dude, you are not, you were, I think you were exempt. You are no longer exempt because you have taken dominion and control over this property and you were working on it. And so he says, I know, but I just thought it would be fun. And I said, well, you understand you're gonna have all kinds of liability. And he goes, yeah, I don't care. So, and he didn't care, right? So again, we were buying 400 homes a month. So, you know, this guy was hitting it. So. Uh, um, so do you have to list the forms um, uh, if you want them included in the contract? Um, the, the seller doesn't necessarily have to provide you with the disclosures that you want unless you have gotten them to agree to it up front. So we have to list all the disclosures that our broker needs uh, in that spot. Maybe, maybe uh, your broker has, for example, an affiliated business addendum an affiliated business disclosure, right? So like uh, we own a piece of the title company or the escrow company, whatever. So, you know, you might just have a form that says addendum number one and you can list it in there. I probably would, I would like to see as much as you can put into here. But again, I'm gonna have to put you back to the advice of your broker. That's why, you know, you, you that's why you hired your broker. You hired your broker for them to represent you and to and to give you counsel, okay? All right, so for example, the MCA, I, that's, com that's coming up. I'm gonna tell you about the MCA in a second the MCA and the WFA because it doesn't show up anywhere in the contract, right? It shows up as a, a part of the entry, but it doesn't show in the contract. So um, uh, I had a broker didn't require that form, but my broker did. I know, and, and you're gonna get that. So what I do, my story started with that REO where the other agent says, you know, yeah, we're exempt. And I go, I tell my buyer, I say, I don't think they are, but okay. So, and then, so then I send them a request for a TDS. They send me back an email and they say, and you need to write this down, this is important. So they send me back an email and they say, I told you we're exempt. Then I send them a second request a day later and they send me back another email and they say, hey, stupid, I told you we're exempt. And then I send them a third request and then I get some nasty thing from that. All three of those emails are going in my file, right? Because I'm gonna be able to prove and I have my buyer sign them, okay? I'm gonna be able to prove that I made the attempt to get a TDS because later on we had a lot of lawsuits in Northern California where it was coming to find out that the banks in fact weren't TDS exempt and now the buyers are suing not only the bank but also suing their own agent. So listen, I need to protect you. Remember we said we talked about protecting ourselves from our own client. So the answer is you just need to show that you made an attempt to get it. Then I have the buyer sign a blank form. I don't fill out anything on the form because it's supposed to be provided by the seller who their agent, the one, the learned person is, is claiming that they are exempt. And so you're refusing to give it to me. That's like your seller refusing it to give it to me. And if later on, it turns out that the seller didn't 
follow a statutory disclosure, I'm going to be, you know, I'm not going to jail with you. So that's my, my favorite saying, I'm not going to jail with you. So, so I make the attempt, I get it in writing that they deny me. And then I give my buyer the form. I have the buyer sign that they saw the form. This is the form I've been trying to get. This is the form they're refusing to give to me. And I'm going to tell you, you can take it to any lawyer in town and they're going to say, you know what? Heads up. That's good. Okay. All right. So uh, they didn't want to sign it. That's fine. They don't have to, you know, I don't care. I'm going to send it over there. They're the agent. And, and, and if they're refusing to give it to their seller, that's going to be on them. Uh, and if it turns out to be a problem later where the buyer gets into litigation and then the seller says, well, I never saw that form. And we say, well, we gave it to your agent. And the law says, we give it to your agent. It's like, we gave it to you. You need to go talk to your agent. And that's when we have little things of law called joinder, right? Where they, they join the listing broker and sue them for the trouble that they got themselves into. So again, I'm just trying to, you know, throw it out there, not legal advice, but that's kind of how I would do it. Right. Okay. All right. So I got a little bit of experience in that. Okay. So Deanne, great question. Yeah, I'd, I'd list it. And if, and if they say no, then have something that documents the fact they refuse to give it to you and then have your buyer see it and say, this is what we're trying to get. They're refusing to give it to me. And it can be your buyer's decision to move forward with that without the official copy filled out by the seller. I'm okay with that. Right. I'm going to go, I'm going to go uh, spend the money. Okay. All right. Everybody good. Probate advisory, again, important. Uh, you should probably read this, right? I mean, you know, I've always heard that, you know, probate sales were exempt from TDS. Eh, sometimes, okay, all right. Uh, you know, again, I'm not gonna give a law class to you, but I teach this in, in, in continuing ed for attorneys. And, and in a lot of cases, the seller can do things that make them no longer exempt. So, um, okay, all right, let's go back. Let's talk about, uh, <clears throat> The trust advisory, same kind of deal. I've got a trust advisory. Whoops, another question. Uh, no, okay. Um, so I have a trust advisory. Let's take a look at what that looks like. And my trust advisory is uh, this form. Um, I like the trust advisory. I think it's really cool. Same, same kind of rules that apply to probate. I don't know what it is, right? Listen, I can't advise my client about this. That would be legal advice. A client says to me, he says, you wrote it, dude. And I go, I Okay, but I want you to see that these are the things that we have to tell you. And this is kind of like, you know, why do we read you your rights, right? Why do we Mirandize you? Because if we just do it from memory, and God knows you've done it enough times, I mean, half of us could do it, right? But, but you've done it enough times. But then, then they come back and they say, we well, didn't read it to me, okay? And you're supposed to read me my rights, okay? Because you, you missed something. And now it's my word against yours. And, and you know what? I'm going to lose. Okay, so I'm not interested in losing. I like winning. Okay, so here I am, property being sold by a trustee of a trust. Okay, definitely a non-natural person. Look at all these things. Megan's Law Disclosure, they're not exempt from that. Oh, I just love it when a real estate agent uh, gives me legal advice. Okay, all right. Everybody good with that? Trust advisory, cool form. Let's take a look at my next form. My next form is going to be my short sale information and advisory. So up top here, we have the addendum, which which created a contractual relationship between the parties. But in my advisory, I'm just making essentially what's known as a disclosure, right? So here I am, I've got my um, short sale information. Oh God, don't do that to me. Uh, short sale information and advisory. It's a couple of pages long, folks. This is more complicated than you think. It is four pages long. So make sure if you're doing a short sale that you include the short sale addendum and the short sale information and advisory. They are two different forms, okay? Buyer's inspection advisory by default in all of your offers. You know, we're just gonna, we're just gonna attach it. There's no way to uncheck that box. And it simply explains to the buyer a whole myriad of, of uh, you know, I told you to have it inspected. That's what it says. It's there to protect you, okay? So, but it explains to the buyer, these are the things that you need to be doing so that you and I don't have to remember to do that. Would you all agree with me that we have a lot of stuff to remember in real estate? I mean, you're taking it seriously. You're sitting here today listening to this stuff. Listen, I, I get $4.50 an hour at trial, okay? I like going to court. All right, but we don't need that. There's no money in this for you and I. So, but you already understand, I'm telling you, I mean, you know, it's the other, you know, 13,000 realtors out there that, that just don't think, see the importance of this, but you understand that it's important. You have so much to remember in real estate. Let's do everything by the number. Remember what I told you before about my buyer offer template? Those are things that we require in our office. We already know up front what this transaction is gonna look like from A to Z. And now we just have to prepare for the stuff that goes out of sync 
with our transaction. And it's not that hard. It just comes from good guidance. It comes from good counsel. Okay, that's all. Statewide buyer and seller information, uh, uh, seller advisory, neat little form. That form is really cool. It's a longy. okay? It's, here it is. I mean, this one's what, 13 pages now? Uh, 14 pages now. Um, and it's got all kinds of good stuff in there. And I had a lawsuit not that long ago. Um, it was a winner, of course, for us. But, but you know, they were suing the buyer over the fact that, that the buyer, you know, the, they thought the buyer was doing the inspections for them. I mean, it just goes through all this stuff. I mean, we probably had five forms in five different places that had language that said, no, you're doing the inspection, Mr. Buyer. Uh, and, and, you know, we don't have any, we don't know anything about that. I don't know what a, a stem wall is. And, I learned a lot in that uh, lawsuit and the stuff I didn't never wanted to know about water properties. So uh, let me tell you, there's a lot of entertainment out there in the industry. Uh, I've got plenty of it already. I don't need more. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at my next form. Uh, my next form is my REO advisory. We already talked about that. It's not a cookie. Okay. An REO advisory, real estate owned. It's property that is owned by a bank. And so, as I said earlier, we're going to have some interesting little differences in properties like that. Let's take a look at my REO advisory form. Here it is. Okay. Again, complicated enough that they created a document for your client to sign. It is two pages long. It's got all kinds of good stuff in there. If you're getting ready to list an REO property, I would read this. I would spend time on this. Your buyer is going to come along and say, I want to write an offer on that property right there. And it's an REO. It's a bank owned property. And you're going to be going like, oh God, what was that form he said again? Um, so take the time while you're home, uh, while you're under house arrest, take the time now to read some of these forms because these forms are here trust me they're here to set you free uh, they are just the way it's going to be okay all right so let's take a look at my uh, next uh, form um, uh, um, other okay so so um, was it Deanne Deanne um, you you asked me a really good question a minute ago all right I'm gonna do that. okay uh, hold on a second I want to make sure I covered it um, and you t you asked me about uh, where was it uh, the MCA where did you ask me that? Uh, there you are, Deanne. So you asked me, where do you put the MCA? So I'm going to tell you. Let's, here's where I'm going to put the MCA, right here. Why? Because up here I put the San Diego Addenda and Advisories. And down here I put down the Buyer and Seller Advisories. And that's what my other is going to be. So I'm going to check the box. And this is just our practice. You do whatever your broker tells you to do. But I'm going to check the box. And I'm going to put C-A-R Forms. And I'm going to put... MCA comma WFA and comma WCMD. I put them in alphabetical order. I messed those two up at the end there. So it would, be, it would start off with MCA, Market Conditions Advisory. I want everybody to know, yeah, I've got a crystal ball, but the batteries are low. I'm not going to be taking any of this. So uh, you told me the house was worth more than it was. We did an RPR. We had to sign that. You know, that's how we do it. Okay. So we got my MCA. I've got my uh, water cons uh, water conserving uh, addendum, the WCMD, okay, and, and because that's not in the contract, right? And I want it in, I want everybody signing it. So if I add it to the contract, now they got to sign it. And there's nothing to put in there other than this is the disclosure, okay? And then finally, my wire fraud advisory. So just because we attach it as, this, as the third form that you see when you write an offer, because we created like a little mini template for you, that doesn't mean it's part of the contract. And I've had people all the time who will take them apart, you know, who will send this and then they won't put the WFA. They'll send the WFA FA, and the other agent will say, oh, you know, buyer or seller's not going to sign it. Why not? Well, you didn't include it in the contract. Well, yeah, there it is right there. And they go, no, 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 it's got to be in the language in the contract. And you know what? They're right. Okay. All right. That's why I remember when we discussed the AD and the PRBS, those are included in the contract, but they're also included in writing in paragraph number two. Okay. Um, can you list those forms again, please? Yes, Deanne, absolutely. So again, and, and I'll send you our template. Send me an email. You all remember how to do that. Send me an email. I will send you my buyer offer template with everything filled out. You know, there's very little for our agents to do. They're going to just go ahead and, you know, fill in the address, the name of the parties, how much they're paying, how much they're putting down, that kind of thing. Okay. But in our template, you'll see right here, check this box right next to it, C-A-R, C period, A period, R period. They like little dots after it. They don't want to be known as a car, okay, or an auto. So car, C-A-R forms, and I do MCA, Market Conditions Advisory. I do 
WCMD, and that's my water conserving uh, uh, disclosure form. And then I do my WFA, which is my wire fraud advisory. Okay. All right, everybody good? Deanna, is that good? You okay? Wanna make sure I'm covering your questions, okay? Because it's important. Your questions are important to me, they really are. Because your questions tell me how you, what you're thinking of. And, and I, maybe I'm missing something, because remember, I'm in the streets. I'm in the streets like you. I'm out writing offers, doing things like that. And I might be seeing things a little differently than you do. Okay, and I want to make sure we cover all that. Everybody good? Questions? Okay, we're doing pretty good today. All right, uh, let's, uh, where am I? Oh, next, okay, here we go. Let's talk about my other terms. Oh God, we got to do paragraph seven. Oh, I'm doomed. Okay, the other terms, this is the part where you get sued. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's a big deal for me. I got in trouble, one of my, one of my, wasn't, she wasn't a broker, but one of the people that was my boss said, you're scaring them. I, I, maybe they need to be scared. I mean, here's a place where you can write stuff. And so remember when we start writing things, Robert Sunderland, who I just think is a brilliant real estate attorney, and he made a comment in a meeting one day, you know, uh, he, he says when a real estate agent writes something that requires a, a comma, they need to talk to their broker. When they write something that needs a semicolon, they need, need to talk to their attorney. It's one of the funniest attorneys I know. And he's just brilliant. I mean, we have some gifted attorneys on our risk management, you know, Pete Selecki, and you know, we've got some brilliant attorneys, but Sunderland cracks me up every time. So just be careful what you write in here. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Talk to your broker about what, you know, should be in there, but sometimes we put in credits, right? Um, just remember, you've got your difference between your lender allowable credit and your contract credit. Okay. Sometimes we put in, you know, we want the kitchen table or, or something like that. Okay. So, just be careful what you write, okay? You'll find when I, if I send you the template, you'll find there's nothing in there for us. We don't have anything put in there, okay? We, we put back on paragraph number three, uh, what F or uh, three uh, D, we put in, you know, about the buyer's been pre-approved for a new loan through, you know, and then we give the name so that the listing agent can call them up without any interference from us, um, but that's as good as it gets. Anybody have any questions? Be careful what you write in here, okay? Be very, very careful, all right? And again, follow your broker's advice. They're, they're there to defend you. They're there to take care of you, make sure you're doing okay. All right, be proud of your broker. I say that all the time. I'm proud of mine. You see the top of the form? Top of our form has, uh, has uh, the, uh, uh, our, our logo on it. You know, we're proud, okay? All right, let's take a look at paragraph number seven, barring any other questions, okay? Paragraph number seven, where's the money? All right, so let's talk about this. We've, we've got a little bit of time. Um, we're going to talk about allocation of costs, okay? So we're done with forms actually for the, at this moment, but now we're going to talk about inspections, reports, and certificates. So unless otherwise agreed in writing, paragraph only determines who is to pay for the inspection, okay? So it's only who's to pay for it, right? This has been such a challenge for us. When we created this version of the contract, uh, what, six years ago? We created this version of the contract. We went to the lenders and we went to escrow, went to title, we went to all the service providers and we said, hey, we're trying to write the perfect contract. We're trying to write something that will keep us from having to do all kinds of other stuff, okay? We wanna make it as inclusive as it could possibly be. So we went to the lender and we said, hey, you know, what's the deal? Why do you keep requiring uh, uh, pest inspection uh, clearances? Uh, you know, some people call it termite. It's not a termite inspection, it's a pest inspection. So, so why do you keep requiring clearance? And they said, because you put it in the contract. And so I was like, oh, really? So yeah, well, we require the clearance because you put it in the contract. Well, see, we feel, the attorneys at CAR and me, we feel that the, the repair work should be a negotiable item between the buyer and the seller. We sure don't want the seller agreeing to pay for repairs that they don't know what they are, right? Because then they come back at us and they say, you didn't tell me it was going to be $15,000. And by the way, I had that case, okay? All right. So, um, all right. So, uh, this, this, so we had to put in language that said, this is only going to say who's going to pay for the, um, for the inspection, the test or the certificate. All right. And so my, my VA buyer agent out there is saying, oh, well, the VA requires it. No, they don't. I've read the VA lender's handbook and they do not require a clearance. Okay. What happens is the appraiser goes out to the property and the appraiser notes something which they're not supposed to know, right? They don't have a structural pest uh, board license. Okay. And so they, they notice something and they, and, and then they call out, you know, I think you need to have it inspected for, you know, pests. And so, you know, so yeah, now in that case, the VA buyer is not allowed to pay for the inspection. 
the VA buyer can be made to pay for the work. So now you create it so that now the, the VA is aware of the fact that it needs a bunch of work and, and, and the, the seller says, I'm not going to pay for the work. And the buyer might end up paying for it. And you, that means you might end up paying for it. So you need to know these facts before you make assumptions and before you make statements. Okay. So the, there's no requirement by law in the state of California. The sales of real property are in their present as is condition. Okay, paragraph number eight, we're gonna get that to next week. Okay, paragraph number eight. And so no obligation by anybody to do any work and that includes pests, okay? So it does not determine who's to pay for the work. There you go, all right? Okay, all right. Um, so down here, what do you do? Paragraph number seven, seven one. Let's talk about seven one, buyer or seller. Okay, depending on your client, you know, they may wanna pay for the work. Okay, natural hazard zone disclosure report. Now, the reason we put that in there is that 1103.7, Civil Code 1103.7 requires that the seller disclose whether or not the property is located in any of six zones identified by the state of California to be hazardous zones. Does it sound like I'm reading you the statute? Yes, it is. Okay, so they have to, they have to make the disclosure. And we provide the form for you at CAR. When you go into your library, you'll find a natural hazard disclosure form. But my non-legal advice, as well as everybody else's, uh, the, the attorneys, all that, say you probably want to have your seller pay the hundred bucks and have somebody else do the report, right? So that because if the seller makes a mistake, great lawsuits on this. If the seller makes a mistake, then what happens is the 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 damages are going to be the price of the property, right? Because you can't move the property out of the zone. It's in the zone. And so if the seller makes a mistake when they fill it out themselves, then they're going to be, they're going to have a problem with that. Instead, we recommend that you have another company, a, a third party do it, make sure it's a reputable company, make sure they have E&O insurance that indemnifies you, okay, to have them do that report and let them take the liability. There's a company out there right now, they got $20 million worth of liability insurance. All right, so I'd be using a company that, that's reputable and it's going to give you a really good report. And I think those are among the most fascinating reports to read. So natural hazard disclosure report. So, so buyer or seller is going to pay for it. Somebody's going to pay for it. Okay, I would probably, the, the one I'm referencing with the E&O insurance gives you the tax uh, report for free. Um, environmental, I think, is free also. You know, they don't charge a la carte. They just charge one fee for everything okay all right so everybody got that that's why the natural hazard is found in a somebody tell me what should go under 7a2 anybody i know this is that pause here's the deal i don't know i i don't know what you put in uh, uh alfred said uh, okay you, you did you write it veronica termite uh, I don't know what that means. Um, I don't know what termites are. Remember, I don't remember legally. I don't know what termites are. I also don't know what mold is. Now, I'm sorry. I have a graduate degree in hazardous materials. I know what mold is. Okay. But I tell everybody, I don't know what mold is. All right. What's the difference between mold and mildew? Okay. So I don't know termites. You know, what's the difference between a termite and a flying ant? Okay. So it's, we've got to be careful about that. My pest inspection is not by termite inspection. So we say sometimes people say termite, what they really should be saying is pest inspection, okay? All right. Um, if you want to, uh, yeah, wood pest, wood destroying pest. Um, <laughs> thank you, Veronica. I know I'm not picking on you. I hope you know that. Um, Alfred, pest inspection. Uh, oh, oh, are you suggesting that goes in 7A2? <sighs> no, no. Okay, this is usually where I write. Okay, Dan, don't write it there. Um, don't write it there. Uh, clue, uh, you can't get a clue anymore. Uh, uh, physical inspection, I wouldn't write it there. You, these are great, these are great things that you guys are mentioning. So here's the deal. If, if I put in, so um, I should, I wish I'd pulled up the WPA form for you. I'll, I'll do that in the future, but the WPA form was a page long written by attorneys, they agonized over it. It said who was going to pay for what. It said what it was going to include. It said you're not going to sue the broker. You know, like I said, we got sued all the time. I mean, all the time. Okay, so here's the logic. So, and the attorneys, they finally said, you know what? Just get rid of it. Okay, make it go away. The buyer can order the pest inspection. The buyer, remember, remember the duties. Okay, so 
seller's duty is to disclose, right? Disclose what they sh what they knew or should have known about the property, right? Standard of care for the seller. Buyer's duty is to investigate. Sorry, I'm writing it at kind of an angle. Buyer's duty is to investigate. Seller's duty is not to investigate. The buyer's duty is to investigate. What's the agent's duty? Agent's duty is what? Reasonably competent, diligent, visual inspection of the premises. I'm not going to write that out. You follow me? It's in the TDS. Okay? It's there. All right? I do trial work on this. Seller's duty is to disclose what they knew or should have known. So for anything you put into 782, I'm telling you, 41 years of doing this, I don't know what to put in there. There's nothing. I think we need to get rid of three, okay? But again, you do what your broker tells you to do, but I'm telling you, anything you put in there, now you've added it to the transaction, and now the lender's going to want to see a clearance. Whatever it is, now the lender's going to... The attorney spent all that to do a page document that was used for 25 years, and they finally just said, let's just get rid of this thing. Okay. All right. So you do what your broker tells you to do. Again, if your broker has a question, they can call me. I'm more than happy to help them with that. Okay. But anything you put in there, you're going to create a problem. Okay. I don't know what to put in there. I just don't. You know, I, I'm happy to say I don't know. Okay. But when I put in pest inspection and I say seller to pay for pest inspection, now the lender's aware of it. Now the lender wants clearance. So... When I asked you the question earlier, does the seller have to pay for the work? And the answer is no, it does not determine who is to pay for the work, but the lender is going to require clearance. So now somebody's got to pay for the work. It's going to either be the seller or the buyer and, uh, or you. Okay. We don't want it to be you because that's expensive. Okay. All right. Question. Good. This is great. Oh, look at you're all looking. Uh, so uh, pest inspection. So, Clue, clue report, no. Um, clue report is not available to you. Here's my advice on the clue report. Okay, clue report does what? Clue report, comprehensive loss underwriting exchange. So the, and we used to write this in here, Kate. We used to put that in the contract. Um, and, and then they stopped letting us do it. LexisNexis owns the clue database and they refuse to give it to us anymore. Only the seller can order the clue report. Okay, seller and who else? The insurance company. So your buyer, usually as a condition of sale, is going to have to get an insurance policy. Remember, the lender wants one, okay? And, and my advice is to have it done early in the contract because it is not a contingency of the transaction. Okay, there's no contingency for insurance in your contract. I assure you of that, okay? So get the buyer down to their insurance company in the first couple of days of contract and have their buyer. Because remember, there's two things on the Clue database. One is the property, I just did this talk in Virginia, virtually of all things, okay? One is the property. The properties show up on the database. If the place has a lot of claims, it's never impossible to get insurance. It just might be really expensive, okay? And then two, people. People who have an inordinate number of claims, right? This is something in the call I was on a couple of days ago, the insurance guy didn't bother to tell everybody that. The people are on it. So if I'm the kind, if I filed five water related claims on properties over the years, you're going to show up on a clue database and, and the insurance company is going to pull that. I guarantee you the buyer's insurance company is going to pull it first thing they do. And they see, you know, you got five claims and then, you know, you're, we're going to have to call Lloyd's of London to get you insurance. All right. So in most transactions, buyer needs insurance and, and it may be the buyer that it has, can't get insurance. And so remember the seller's not paying for the insurance, the buyer is. And so again, if the property has multiple claims on it, then you know, I had a property I owned it. We had two water related claims in a year, okay? And, and they did the work on it. They, and, and the same insurance company did the work on, on both. I probably couldn't have gotten away with a third claim. And when I sold the house, I made the buyer aware we'd had two water related claims and the buyer went to their insurance company and their insurance company pulled the clue report, okay? All right. Physical inspection. The buyer already has a right to do the physical inspection. Take a look at paragraph number 12. They've already got the right to do the physical. They've got the right to do the, uh, the pest inspection. It's, it's well written. Come back to paragraph 12 when we're doing that. You're going to have, you're going to see, it makes a lot of sense. All the language that you used to see, if you've been around long enough, that this used to be paragraph number 4A, um, and it, it was all half a page two, okay? Um, and, and we just took all that language and we moved it over to paragraph number 12. So now it doesn't have a checkbox in front of it. The lender says, okay, we're happy, right? And it puts all the stuff in that the buyer can do. 
Okay, the buyer can order physical inspection, he can order a manometer reading, he can order all kinds of inspections. If you're wondering what kind of inspections the buyer can order, go get the buyer's election of inspections form from SDAR. You're going to see, wow, pages and pages of inspections. And then we make the mistake of only telling them, <coughs> excuse me, to do the physical inspection. Does that make sense? Okay, excuse me just one second here. Buyer and remember too, the buyer has a right to do inspections. If you put it in here, then the buyer must do inspections. See the difference? Okay. And so later on, the buyer says, I don't want to do the inspections. And this doesn't create a contract between you and the buyer. This is a contract created between the seller and the buyer. And so now the buyer has to do the inspection. So if you put it in there, now the buyer's got to pay and got to do the inspection. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, agent does what? Um, Agent's duty down here. I'm sorry, James, you asking me? Uh, yes, James. The agent's duty is to invest. I'm sorry. The agent's duty is to conduct a reasonably competent, diligent visual inspection. So if you pull up the TDS and you take a look at paragraph number four, okay, paragraph number uh, three is the agent's, the, the uh, listing agent's inspection. Four is the buyer's agent's inspection. So it says right in there, came straight out of the Straussburger case, the reasonably competent, diligent visual inspection of the property. Okay, that is the code. Every, every attorney I talk to that's a real estate attorney, it, it's gonna come up in a sentence. It just does, we've just all been trained, okay? Um, the seller's duty is to disclose what they knew or should have known. So when the seller investigates their own property, they're raising the bar on themselves. And we don't really want that. So we want the buyer, the law says the buyer has a duty. I'm going to use that word here. I can't use it in court because the judge's decision is whether or not they had a duty. But the duty is the buyer has an obligation to investigate the property and make sure the property works for them. Seller doesn't have to go to the heroic uh, methods or efforts to create more you know, work for themselves. It's the buyer. Seller has to tell the buyer what they know about. Seller can't say, go figure it out on your own. Uh -uh, don't work like that. Seller must tell the buyer what they knew or should have known. B is government requirements and retrofit. So we have smoke alarms, not smoke detectors. We used to call them detectors, now they're alarms. And carbon monoxide device insulation and water heater bracing. If required by law, and the answer is yes, it's required by law. There's some theory in California that you have to put the water heater on an 18 inch stand. It's gotta have two big straps around it. It have to be at least what? Inch and a half in diameter or whatever, or width or whatever. Uh, and the theory is that if the water heater, you know, in an earthquake, the water heater topples off the stand, which I don't know why it was on the stand in the first place, but okay, topples off the stand, then the, then the gas line could rupture and, and levels the house and the whole neighborhood and all that. It has never happened in the state of California. I assure you it has never happened. But there's the legislature's thought, wow, what would happen if that happened? And so that's why they put that in there. Okay, so it's, uh, that's the law in California. Buyer or seller can pay for that. When I'm representing my investor, Deanne, I'm going to check buyer. Because, you know, what is that going to cost? It's going to, what, a smoke, a smoke alarm is what? I go to Costco for 20 bucks. I got two of them. Okay. So, but you know what? All the seller sees is I got to pay for that. And, you know, it's like, how much does it cost to do water heater bracing? 70 bucks. Okay. If I'm representing an investor who is not writing a full price offer, I'm going to probably check all the buyer columns on all paragraph number seven, right? I'm going to have a buyer pay for everything. The buyer says, well, I don't want to do that. Says, You're an investor, right? How much do you think that's going to cost you? Okay. And, and then that changes the conversation. Okay. All right. Um, let's go to the next page because we're going to have to move. Um, uh, so that was B1. B2 says that the seller shall pay, somebody's going to pay for the cost of compliance um, with uh, any other minimum mandatory. So my low flow toilets, you know, things like that. Okay. Um, shower heads, hose bibs, stuff like that. If required by law, little uh, I says the same thing. Who's going to pay for it? In my, in our offers, um, you know, the, the you know, buyer, we write it where the seller pays it. In, in uh, as a listing agent, we counter it out. It's in our it's in our template. We counter it out by default that the buyer will pay for that because we don't know what kind of toilet you want. Okay, and it's not just toilets, right? It's other stuff. So uh, um, somebody's got to produce the 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 uh, San Diego's got the water conservation certificate. But remember, San Diego's also got the transfer of responsibility water conservation certificate. So when we're representing the seller, we hit you with the transfer. When you're representing the buyer, we ask the seller to pay for it. Okay, that's all. 
Um, escrow and uh, questions, uh, no. Uh, escrow and title, we're all familiar with that. You know, nobody cares about escrow and title except to the agents. It's a fight, you know, and why, folks? Listen, so they can't bring you donuts anymore. They can't buy you cars. They can't buy you computers. They can't do anything illegal, right? Senate Bill 133, which was just a rewrite of the original bill. Hey, John, uh, the stand is a garage thing. Gasoline fumes out the ground. I get it. The thought is that the water heater, uh, wa hot water flame being elevated will not ignite gasoline flames. Yeah, I know you and I know, right, John? But no one thought of a gas dryer in the garage with a huge flame just above the floor. Well, better yet, there's no instance of, of the gas line. You know, it's like people say, well, what happened in San Francisco at Fisherman's Wharf when all those houses caught on fire? Well, they didn't catch on fire because of the water here. They got caught on fire because of the pipes in the ground, right? Because they put them through the concrete like they do the party homes up in uh, the Del Mar uh, height up there uh, on Mango and all those places. So uh, thank you, John. Um, okay. Escrow and title. So let's take a look at escrow and title. All right. So escrow and title, there is no law that requires escrow or title. Okay. I'm going to tell you, it makes really good business sense. And that's what the judges say. The judge says, well, you know, it was easy to obtain, like title insurance. It was easy to obtain, readily available, uh, fairly low cost, uh, worth the risk, uh, and uh, you should have done it. Right. So it's not a law, but it's probably a good idea. There's no requirement by, by law that you have insurance of any kind, except auto insurance. You do have to have auto insurance, right, John? So, but here's the thing. If you don't have it, you're cooked and you know the lender's gonna require it, right? Now, come on, the lender wants insurance, right? Why? Because it makes sense. Not only do they want title insurance to protect their interest in the property, but they also want you to have hazard insurance in case the place burns to the ground, okay? All right, so let's take a look at it. Buyer or seller, so Deanne, you mentioned earlier, we usually put in split one half between buyer and seller, and we write it that way. We don't put in as customary or as normal or everybody does it. We don't do that because there is no such thing as customary, okay? It's not like commissions, <clears throat> but we'll get into a transaction where the seller's chosen, I'm sorry, AKA listing agent has chosen the escrow company and the seller's getting a deal on the, on the escrow fee because why? Because they put it back on the buyer. So that's why we like to have it clean. And again, we're only talking about the escrow fee. We're not talking about all the little garbage fees that are associated with it. So you get put in your language, escrow holders, you have to name the escrow holder. Please don't put in seller's choice, right? Contract fails for vagueness. So we want to make sure that we name the escrow holder. We want to make sure that we name the title company. I understand that the seller may want to use somebody different, aka the listing agent, you know, wants to do something different. But at the end of the day, my job is to represent my buyer. And so I am going to write things on my buyer's interest. I'm not writing the offer for the seller and I'm clearly not writing it for the listing agent. Okay, everybody good? All right, so name the company. Do not leave it open, all right? Don't leave it blank. Don't leave don't, your call. Uh, seller's choice makes me crazy, okay? It just really does. Never put seller's choice in the contract, all right? Okay, the parties shall within how many days? Five days, we talked about this last week. After receipt, sign and return the escrow holder's general provisions. I've had real estate agents say, well, no, I hang on to the general provisions. I don't have a have the buyer sign them until you know a couple of weeks because it's a contingency of the contract. <laughs> no, it's not. And, and guess what? By contract, they've agreed to get it back there within five days. And so if you are holding on to those documents, then you are have you have that little tort called interference with contract. Okay, just saying. All right, so make sure your seller, and you can change the days. Um, I like five. Five is good. They get them. There's plenty of time to fill them in. And there's some important stuff in there, like right, the preliminary change of ownership form, things like that, um, that are going to save people money. So they need to get those things done, okay? All right, paragraph number two. Again, buyer or seller, you pick it. Uh, in our offer, we write seller to pay for the owner's policy of title insurance. But again, if I'm representing an investor buyer, I might say buyer. I mean, you know, how much is the title insurance, right? And remember that the seller may not require the buyer to use a particular title company, okay? It's a violation of, what is it, 1502? It's, a, it's 15... Uh, U.S. Code 2602, I think, A. Uh, I have it. I'll send it to you. Um, but essentially, it says that if the seller requires the buyer to use a particular title company, they could be subject to treble damages, which means three times the cost of the policy. By the way, there has to be a government-insured loan in there, like a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, something like that. Okay, so cash doesn't apply. 
All right, so the seller requiring the buyer to use a particular title company could create problems for everybody. So don't be thinking we know everything and you can't give legal advice to your clients. So, you know, you're the buyer's agent, write in the buyer, whoever the buyer wants. I don't know who to use, pull up the different policies, give them choices, give them three, right? I always tell you, give them three, okay? All right, um, and then, uh, who's it going to be issued by? Once again, their call. I like them making that decision. Now, do I have favorites? Yes, I do. Okay, we all have favorites, right? And we all like them to use that. But remember, you can't answer the question, who should I use? Because that would be bad advice. What you can use is you. I can answer, and I tell them this. I say, I can't tell you who to use, but I can tell you who I use. Okay, and so you just decide if you want to use somebody I use. That's up to you but I'm not going to warranty it. And we're going to see that later on in the contract that, you know, there's no warranty for anything I'm going to say anyway. Okay. All right. Uh, and then finally, buyers shall pay for any title insurance policy. There's that buyer's lender part. Okay. So when your buyer gets that bill on the escrow statement, the closing statement that says title insurance, they're going to say to you, well, I thought we're the seller was supposed to pay the title insurance. And your answer, of course, is, of course, take a look at paragraph number 7C2, and it shows you have to pay for the lender's policy. Okay. All right, everybody good? I'm excited. Let's go to the next page. Okay. Um, good. <laughs> this will wrap it up. Okay. All right. I'm trying to think, is there more to 10 or seven? No, there isn't. Okay. So let's talk about, finally, let's talk about our other costs. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anybody. Everybody got it in there? Okay. All right. So uh, let's take a look at our final cost. So other costs, okay? And and so we have a really good crowd here today. We have some veteran agents in here. We have some new agents in here. And so some of the stuff I'm going to tell you may, may not be the stuff the way you're doing it, but maybe I can help you with why I do what I do, okay? Or at least, you know, how the contract works. So remember, you are creating a, an agreement between a buyer and a seller. You are not a party to this agreement. So question, do you fill out these, these paragraphs? Absolutely. Right? Because remember, what happens if you don't fill out the paragraph and you don't allocate the cost to either the buyer or the seller? Who pays for that? You do. So I'm going to check boxes whether they're going to apply or not. Okay? And if they don't apply, then fine. Okay? You don't even have to hit it in a counteroffer. Right? But if I check the box, so if, let's take a look. County transfer tax. I had a broker arguing with me one day, and it's still a broker for a very large company, argued with me one day that a property that we were selling in Del Mar um, wasn't subject to the county transfer tax. I said, okay, I don't have a problem with that. Here's the deal. I'm the buyer's agent. And I said, as long as if we find out it is subject to the county transfer tax, surprised, right? That that it wasn't, then then you agree to pay for it. Well, they did a little more research because they were pretty good about that. They looked it up and they go, God, I can't believe that. It actually is subject to county transfer tax. Listen, folks, I don't know of a property you're going to sell in San Diego County that's not subject to the county transfer tax. Okay. So if you don't check the box, who pays for it? You do. So you you call, you know, in my template, it's going to say seller. Okay. So we have seller pay for it. How about city transfer tax? I'm going to say seller. Okay. Oh, well, you'd say, well, wait a minute. Nobody has a city transfer tax. There's none in the city of, or the county of San Diego that I'm aware of, right? Del Mar, remember Del Mar fought for one. They, it was prop N at one point. <clears throat> I still have a garage full of signs that say vote no on N. So anyway, and John, you know, that's me, right? I'm pretty political that way. Um, I, I don't believe in paying for stuff that, that, you know, but you know what, it'll be just my luck. If I don't check that box, the place I'm selling, I'm selling a house in San Marcos, and the place I'm selling, San Marcos will pass a city transfer tax the day before we close, okay? And so if I don't check the box, who pays the bill? I do, okay? So I'm going to check the box, all right? So, so far I'm going uh, two for two. Um, seller pays for HOA transfer fees, okay? Uh, do all properties have HOA transfer fees? And the answer is no, not necessarily, Okay. Is it possible that there are some, I mean, we have clues, right? So like there's a gate around all of the properties, mm -hmm. a common pool, a common tennis court, a guard. <laughs> there are things that are common to the whole area. <coughs> Excuse me. We're probably going to have an HOA transfer fee. Okay. But you know, maybe I don't have all those indicators. Maybe I want to do it anyway. So like take, for example, the ruse in, in Del Mar. So in Del Mar, north of Del Mar Heights Road, um, uh, west of Crest, uh, east uh, uh, east of uh, Knob um, is a community called the Ruse, R-U-E, Rue Dan Teves, you know, all those Ruse, okay? And guess what? They have a homeowner association. 
you would never know it, right? It's just a bunch of nice, cool, cool houses that were built back in the 70s, and, and uh, they have an HOA. It's a voluntary HOA. I happen to know that. I've sold a lot of property in there. But are you willing to take the chance, right? Kind of like, I can't remember if I fired five or was it six. You know, do you feel lucky? Okay, so the question is, homeowners association, I'm going to check seller. I'm just going to do that, right? And if it doesn't apply, it doesn't apply. And no, listing agent, you don't need to counter it out. Because if it doesn't apply, it doesn't apply. Okay? All right. Okay. Unless you're looking for something to write in a counter offer so you can hide your escrow and title company in there. Okay? Paragraph number four, seller is automatically going to be preparing, uh, paying HOA fees required to uh, by civil code 4525. One of my favorite little civil codes. It does a lot of things uh, to, to help us, to protect us, but there are some documents that are required. The problem is a lot of these management, it's not the HOA, it's the management companies will load a bunch of other stuff on there and, and then all of a sudden what was a $200 transfer fee is, is now going to be, you know, $800. So, so much so that we introduce legislation to limit it, okay? So automatically seller pays for that. Paragraph number five, um, buyer or seller pays for HOA fees for all those required other than those required by civil code uh, uh, 4525. You know, of course, everybody wants to call me when I'm doing a webinar. Get off. Okay, whatever. All right. Okay. So everybody follow that. So paying for HOA fees for documents other than those required by civil code. Okay. So you make a decision who that's going to be. All right. Who do we do? We usually write the offer for the buyer. So we usually have the buyer uh, pay for that. Um, so just check seller pays for all and let them counter if they don't want to pay for it. Well, essentially not, not necessarily, but I'm going to show you why. Watch this. Okay. So Dan, you're close. Okay. So here I'm either going to be buyer, seller, your call, whatever you want to do. Number six says buyer is going to pay for HOA cert. Not going to give a choice. It's buyers, <coughs> excuse me, the buyer's paying the HOA cert fee. Okay. All right. Number seven, somebody's going to pay for the transfer fee. Okay. Anybody know how much a private transfer fee is? There's a lot more of those out there than you think. So I'm going to usually check that box. Okay. And again, this is just me. All right. I'm going to probably check that box, whether I know one is there or not. So I sold a house out there in uh, just north of Santa Luz, what we call that Del, uh, Del Sur. Sold a place out there. Goodness gracious, would you believe there was a monster private transfer fee out there? Okay. So I'm not going to get into where they come from because that's going to keep us past our time here today. But the answer is I'm checking the box. If it doesn't apply, then I'm not going to worry about it. You know, a listing agent may make a fuss, but it's usually to hide something in a counter offer. I mean, that's just, you know, that's how we teach them to do things. Okay. All right. So Deanne, paragraph number eight and nine, what do I put in there? I love the fact that you're all here. I really do. So, cause this is cool. So here's what I see. Here's what I see in eight and nine. I see buyer's agent checking the box because you know the buyer didn't check it the buyer's agent checks the box and says tc fee okay you lose your license for this okay all right remember that if the buyer's agent is going to collect a fee from their buyer it must be included in the employment agreement aka buyer representation agreement i had this eye-to-eye -eye conversation with the deputy commissioner she says we think that's a junk fee and we think you should be collecting that in your, well, she said 6%. I thought, you know, you can't say that. That's against the law, right? Okay. All right. Not that I would know. Okay. So TC fee, no. It doesn't have the language over here that says that all commissions are negotiable. Remember your listing agreement? Remember your buyer representation agreement? It said on the paragraph number three, the one that talks about commission says, all fees, you call it anything you want to call it, all fees are negotiable. And it doesn't include that language here. Okay. Now, if your broker tells you to do it, I would, I would suggest you have your broker give me a call, but uh, I want to keep you out of trouble. How do we tell agents to stop putting the TC fee there? You don't. You know, they write the offer, they put it in there, and then, and then guess what? I'm going to counter it back. Anyway, I'm going to counter back. You know, paragraph 7, uh, 7D8 uh, does not apply to this transaction because, again, I'm not going to jail with you, and I'm not going to create an agreement between a buyer and a seller having, uh, having uh, you know, that – has a third party getting paid. Remember, you're not a party to the contract. So the buyer's agent who writes it in there is asking for the seller to agree to have the buyer pay for their TC fee. Does that make any sense? No. Okay. And that's why it doesn't work. Again, remember, it doesn't have the, the required language. The DRE language, by the way, you know, all commissions are negotiable by law. It's in your listing agreements, in your buyer representation agreement, and the DRE has said any fee you collect has to be in that paragraph, has to accompany that, that language, okay? And it's not here, 
all right? And I have specifically sat in front of Veronica and she goes, we think it's a junk fee. We used to write it in our, our uh, listing agreement and in our buyer representation agreement. And one day in a meeting, it was October, three years ago now, uh, she said in a meeting, eh, we think that's a junk fee. <laughs> I didn't bother to offer the fact we've been doing it for years, but you know, because at one point they said it was okay. But we all know that the rules change. And so, listen, I'm not going to mess with the department. I like the department of real estate. They're there to help us, right? They're our friend, right? You all know that, right? Okay. So I'm not going to do that. So anything goes in here. I don't know what goes in eight and nine. I'm right back there to, I don't know. I don't know what goes in eight and nine. I don't know what goes in seven, eight, two, and three. I don't know. Well, it's there. And I'd be more than happy to talk to your attorney about it. Paragraph number 10. Home warranty plan. Home warranty plan is an insurance policy. There's no law that requires one. I think it's a really good idea. I like home warranty plans uh, and they're not all alike. So I do like my buyer deciding which home warranty plan to use because most of your buyers are like, I don't know what plan to use. And some of us are really bright, right? So we think we have the answer, but then we go ahead and we say, well, we want you to use, we think we should use this one or we'll just put it in there. And if you don't say anything, we'll assume it's okay. Okay. And then guess what happens? You know, it doesn't cover a roof. And it's like, oh, you know, so while the agents are nickel and diamond over, you know, $365 versus $455, you know, and then, and then the buyer gets a policy doesn't work anyway, that's, that's going to be a problem. So I, I kind of like the buyer making the decision. And, and frankly, you should include your buyer in the process of buying the home. You should get their input. This is not about you writing an offer for you. This is about you writing an offer for the buyer. So once again, I'm going to send them three links. I'm going to send them the three top plans that I know of, and I'm going to send them a caveat that says, hey, you know what? You know, there's lots of plans out there. You let me know which one you want me to put in there. Okay? That's just how it's going to be. So again, who's going to pay for it? We normally ask the seller. We have to put a limit. So we, I think we were 565. Um, we usually do the upgraded policy that happens to be covered by this. Remember, if you write it in there and it doesn't cover the cost of the plan that you're suggesting, you're probably going to get the bill for the difference. Okay. One home warranty issued by, and guess what? Put in the choice that the buyer makes, not buyer's choice, not seller's choice. Put in the name of the company, much like we did back up with escrow and title. Okay. Now you need to know, does it have air conditioning? Does it have pool? Those are extra coverages. Those are going to cost more money. And if you don't put them on at the time of the policy, at the time of the, of the closing, then you're going to, you may have some challenges later. If there's a claim, you know, they're not going to pay it. Right. Cause remember they're an insurance company and their job is to deny claims. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's an insurance company. They're, they're there to help you, but at the same time, they're there to make money. Okay. All right. And then other, uh, if there's something else. So like, for example, refrigerator, washer, dryer. Okay. Putting it in here, putting refrigerator, washer, and dryer in here does not include it in the transaction. It just includes the coverage. So make sure later on when you've done the parts, you know, make sure you're asking for the refrigerator, washer, and dryer. Otherwise you have coverage on something that doesn't necessarily exist. Uh, sorry. I'm also, well, <laughs> uh, Deanne, talk to me separate about that. That's cool. I got some suggestions for you. Uh, why 565? Seems like an odd number. Um, we use uh, Crest Fidelity Home Warranty. It's uh, it's just a, a one. It's a it's not an a la carte program. They got a couple things you could add, and I think that's 565 for a house. Um, condos. Uh, we do a lot of manufactured housing. That's probably like 465. So you know, but we look it up. And, you know, at the end of the day, the house is selling for a million five, and we're and we're playing games over 60 bucks. You know, I just look at it and I go, you know what, really. You know, the seller needs to factor in, in, in the amount that they want to get for the property, the cost of sale. That includes the commissions, and that includes whatever fees or other, otherwise incidental of the transaction. As a listing agent, we get the seller a cost sheet. We get it right away from escrow. Somebody's going to know it better than most people know it. And so, yeah, um, 565 happens to be the number for that policy, I'm pretty sure. Um, but again, I'd have to ask Linda because it's in our template. So whatever our template says, use that. Or, I'm sorry, you do whatever your broker tells you to do. <laughs> okay, thank you, James. Good question though, man. <clears throat> okay, uh, where am I here? Okay, so buyers informed. Let's clear out some of this stuff. Buyers informed home warranty plans may have additional coverages, and that's why I like giving them a copy of the policy. Give them a copy of the brochure, okay? They all have it. Crest, uh, Fidelity has it. First American has it. You know, all these places have these brochures. Send them copies of the brochures. Tell them to look at it. Tell them what you know. Trust me, they like, they appreciate the fact you've involved them in the transaction, okay? Um, again, who should I use? 
don't know. Well, here's the policy. Uh, who do you use? Okay, well, I like this one. Okay, all right. Okay, um, and the buyer is advised, like I just said, I've been saying, to investigate. All the buyer's duty is to investigate. Interesting, okay. Uh, investigate those coverage to determine what's best, uh, most suitable for the buyer, okay? Buyer's duty is to investigate, okay? All right, good. Or, finally, buyer waives the right, okay? Buyer can waive the right to uh, policy. Buyer can say, yeah, I don't need a home warranty policy. I, I'm Mr. Mr. Fix-It. I like to fix things, okay? I don't know. I don't think I've ever sold a home that didn't have a home warranty on it. Um, home warranty companies lose money in the first year. That's standard. Everybody knows it. Um, they make their money on the renewals. Okay. So frankly, I think it's probably a good idea the first year. Thank you all. Take care for now. Need more help? Contact SDAR member services at 858-715-8040 or membership at sdar.com.